section 19, page 87. Vincent was not a journalist by choice. He was a pure man of letters, ultimately born in a world that had no need of letters. But after publishing one volume of brief and execute literary appreciations, of which 120 copies were sold, 30 given away, and the balance eventually destroyed by the publishers, in parentheses, as per contract. To make room for more marketable material, he had abandoned his real calling and taken a sub-editorial job on a woman's weekly, where fashion plates and pepper patterns alternated with New England love stories and advertisements of temperance drinks. On the subjects of heart fires, in the parentheses, as the paper was called, he was inexhaustibly entertaining, but beneath his fun lurked the sterile bitterness of the still young man who has tried and given up. His conversations always made Arker take the measure of his own life and feel how little it contained, but Vincent's, after all, contained still less, and though their common fund of intellectual interests and curiosities made their talks exhilarating, their exchange of views usually remained within the limits of a passive dilentism. The fact is, life isn't much of a fit for either of us, Vincent had once said. I am down and out, nothing to be done about it. I have got only one where to produce, and there is no market for it here, and won't be in my time. But you are free, and you are well off. Why don't you get in touch? There is only one way to do it, to go into politics. Arker threw his head back and laughed. Darwin saw at a flash the unbridgeable difference between men like Vincent and the others, Arker's kind. Everyone in polite circles knew that, in America, a gentleman couldn't go into politics, but since he could hardly put in that way to the Vincent, he answered evasively, Look at the career of the honest man in American politics. They don't want us. Who is they? Why don't you all get together and be they yourself? Arker laughs lingered on his lips in a slightly condescending smile. It was useless to prolong the discussion. Everybody knew the melancholy fate of the few gentlemen who had risked their clean line in municipal or state politics in New York. The day was past when that sort of thing was possible. The country was in possession of the bosses and emigrants, and decent people had to fall back on sport or culture. Culture, yes, if we had it, but there are just a few little local patches dying out here and there for a lack of well hoeing and cross fertilizing and lost remnants of the old European tradition that your forebears brought with them. But you are in a beautiful little minor minority. You have got no center, no competition, no audience. You are like the pictures on the walls of a deserted house. The portrait of a gentleman. You will never amount to anything, any of you, till you roll up your sleeves and get right down into the mug. That or emigrate. God, if I could emigrate... Arker mentally shrugged his shoulders and turned the conversation back to the books, where Vincent, if uncertain, was always interesting. Emigrate, as if a gentleman could abandon his own country. One could no more do that than one could roll up one's sleeves and go down into the muck. A gentleman simply stayed at home and abstained. But you couldn't make a man like Vincent see that. And that was why the New York of literary clubs and exotic restaurants though a first shake made it seem more of a kaleidoscope, turned out in the end to be a smaller box with a more monotonous pattern than the assembled atoms of the Fifth Avenue. The next morning, Arker skirted the, the town in vain for more yellow roses. In consequence of this search, he arrived late at the office, perceived that his doing so made no difference whatever to anyone and was filled with sudden exasperation at the elaborate futility of his life. Why should he not be, at that moment, on the sands of the St. Augustine with May Vellon? No one was deceived by his pretense of professional activity. In old-fashioned legal firms like that of which Mr. Little Blair was the head, and which were mainly engaged in the management of large estates and conservative investments, there were always two or three young men, 
fairly well off and without professional ambition who, for a certain number of hours of each day, sat at their desks accomplishing trivial tasks or simply reading the newspapers, though it was supposed to be proper for them to have an occupation. The crude fact of money-making was still regarded as derogatory, and the law, being a profession, was accounted a more gentlemanly pursuit than business, but none of these young men had much of hope of really advancing in his profession or any earnest desire to do so. And over many of them, the green malt of the perfunct tree was already perceptibly spreading. It made Arker shiver to think that it might be spreading over him too. He had, to be sure, other tastes and interests. He spent his vacations in European travel, cultivated the clever people May spoke of, and generally tried to keep up, as he had somewhat wistfully put it to Madame Olenska. But once he was married, what would become of his narrow margin of life in which his real experiences were lived? He had seen enough of other young men who had dreamed his dreams, though perhaps less ardently, and who had gradually sunk into the placid and luxurious routine of their elders. From the office he sent a note by messenger to Madame Alaska, asking if he might call that afternoon and begging her to let him find a reply at his club. But at the club he found nothing, nor did he receive any letter the following day. This unexpected silence mortified him beyond reason, and though the next morning he saw a glorious cluster of yellow roses behind a florist's window pane, he left it there. It was only on the third morning that he received a line by post from the Countess Alaska. To his surprise, it was dated from Skytercliff, whither the Van der Duydens had promptly retreated after putting the Duke on board his steamer. I ran away, the writer began abruptly, in parentheses, without the usual preliminaries. The day after I saw you at the play, and these kinds of kind friends have taken me in, I wanted to be quiet and think things over. You were right in telling me how kind they were. I feel myself so safe here. I wish that you were with us, she ended with a conventional yours sincerely, and without any allusion to the date of her return. Do not of the not surprise the young man. What was Madame Alaska running away from, and why did she feel the need to be safe? His first thought was some dark menace from abroad. Then he reflected that he did not know her epistolary style and that it might run to a picturesque execration. Well, not always exaggerated, and moreover, she was not fully at her he ease in English, which she often spoke as if she were translated from the French. Je me suis avide, put in that way. The opening sentence immediately suggested that she might merely have wanted to escape from a boring round of engagements, which was very likely true, for her judged her to be capricious and easily weird of the pleasure of the moment. It amused him to think of the van der Luydens having carried her off to the Skyter Cliff on a second visit, and this time for an indefinite period. The doors of Skyter Cliff were rarely and grudgingly opened to visitors, and a chilly weekend was the most ever offered to the fifth house thus privileged. But Arker had seen on his last visit to Paris the delicious play of La Bucci, La Voyage de M. Perichon, and he remembered M. Perichon's dodged and undiscouraged attachment to the young man whom he had pulled out of the glacier. The Van der Ludens had rescued Madame Alaska from a doom almost as icy, and though there were many other reasons for being attracted to her, Arka knew that beneath them all lay the gentle and obstinate determination to go on rescuing her. He felt a distinct disappointment on learning that she was away, and almost immediately remembered that only the day before he had refused an invitation to spend the following Sunday with the Reggie Shiverses at their house on the Hudson a few miles below Skytercliff. He had had his fill long ago of the noise-friendly parties at Highbank, with coasting, ice-boating, sliding, long tramps in the snow, 
and a general flavor of mild flirting and milder practical jokes. He had just received a box of new books from his London bookseller and had preferred the prospect of a quiet Sunday at home with his spoils. But he now went into the club writing room, wrote a hurried telegram and told the servant to send it immediately. He knew that Mrs. Reggie didn't object to her visitors suddenly changing their minds and that there was always a room to spare in her elastic house. Yeah. Chapter 15 Newland Archer arrived at the Shearses on Friday evening and on Saturday went conscientiously through all the rights appertaining to a week and high bank. In the morning, he had stepped in the ice boat with his hostess and a few of the hardier guests. In the afternoon, he went over the farm with Reggie and listened in the elaborately appointed stables to long and impressive disquisitions on the horse. After tea, he talked in a corner of the firelit hall with a young lady who had professed herself broken-hearted when his engagement was announced, but was now eager to tell him of her own matrimonial hopes. And finally, about midnight, he assisted in putting a goldfish in one's visitor's bath, dressed up a burglar in bathroom of nervous aunt, and saw in the small hours by joining in a pool of fights that range from the nurseries to the basement. But on Sunday, after luncheon, he brought a cutter and drove over to Skytercliff. People had always been taught that the house at Skytercliff was an Italian villa. Those who had never been to Italy believed it. So did some who had. The house had been built by Mr. Van der Luyden in his yacht on his return from the Grand Tour, and in anticipation of his approaching marriage with Miss Lisa de Gallet. It was a large square wooden structure with tongued and grooved walls painted pale green and white, a Corinthian portico, and fluted plasters between the windows, from the high ground on which it stood a series of terraces bordered by balustrades and urns descended in the steel engraving style to a small irregular lake with an asphalt edge overhung by rare weeping conifers. To the right and left, the famous widow's lawn studded with specimen trees. In parentheses, each of a different variety. Rolled away to long ranges of grass crested with elaborate cast iron ornaments, and below, in a hollow, lay the four roomed stone house which the first patron had built on the land granted him in 1612. Against the uniform sheet of snow, the greyish winter sky, the Italian villa loomed up rather grimly. Even in summer it kept its distance, and the boldest coolest bed had never ventured nearer than thirty feet from its awful front. Now, as Arker rang the bell, the long tinkle seemed to echo through the um, mausoleum, and the surprise of the butler who at length responded to the call, was as great as though he had been summoned from his final sleep. Happily Archer was of the family, and therefore, irregular though his arrival was, entitled to be informed that the Countess Olanska was out, having driven to the afternoon service with Mr. Weiner Luden exactly three quarters of an hour earlier. Mr. Weiner Luden, the butler continued, is in, sir. But my impression is that he is either finishing his nap or else lead reading yesterday's evening post. I heard him say, sir, on his return from church this morning, that he intended to look through the evening post after luncheon. If like, sir, I must go to the library door and listen. But Arker, thanking him, said that he would go and meet the ladies, and the butler, obviously relieved, closed the door on him majestically. A groom took the cutter to the stables, and Archer struck through the park to the high road. The village of Skytercliff was only a mile and a half away, but he knew that Mr. Van der Luyden never walked, and that he must keep to the road to meet the carriage. Presently, however, coming down a footpath that crossed the highway, he caught sight of a slight figure in a red cloak 
with a big dog running ahead. He hurried forward, and Madame Anoska stopped short with a smile of welcome. Ah, oh, you have come, she said, and drew her hand from her mouth. The red cloak made her look gay and vivid, like the Elamingots of old days, and he laughed as he took her hand and answered, I came to see what you were running away from. Her face clouded over, but she answered, Ah, well, you will see presently. The answer puzzled him. Why, do you mean that you have been overtaken? She shrugged her shoulders with a little moment like Nastasia's and rejoined in a lighter tone. Shall we walk on? I am so cold after the sermon. And what does it matter now you are here to protect me? The blood rose to his temples and he cut off a cold of her cloak. Ellen, what is it you must tell me? Uh, presently, let's run a race, race first. My feet are freezing to the ground, she cried, and gathering up the cloak, she fled away across the snow, the dog leaping about her with challenging barks. For a moment, Arker stood watching, his gaze delighted by the flash of the red meteor against the snow. Then he started after her, and they met, panting and laughing, at a wicked death led into the park. She looked at him and smiled. I knew you would come. That shows you wanted me to, he returned, with a disproportionate joy in their nonsense. The white glitter of the trees filled with the air with its own mysterious brightness, and as they walked on over the snow on the ground, seemed to sink under their feet. End of the chapter, page 93